Welcome to Dementia Dialogue. The week of March 15th to 21st is Brain Awareness Week with a focus on brain science. Today's episode is one of two where we are exploring the relationship between research participants and researchers, moving from an expert subject model to an investigator participant model. Jill Churchman's husband, David, has frontal temporal dementia and is a participant in a research project. Jill is an active care partner and research partner and serves on the patient community advisory committee for the project. Rick Swartz is a clinical physician and researcher at Sunnybrook Hospital and the University of Toronto. He co-leads the Ontario Neurodegenerative Disease Research Initiative. I spoke separately with Jill and Rick last week. He was officially diagnosed in 2015, but it took six years for him to get the diagnosis. In that six-year period, how long a search uh, was it to get that diagnosis that you were confident in? It was quite intense. We um, saw nine different specialists and he had a multitude of misdiagnoses, multitude of different drugs, multitude of invasive testing, all to come back and what the original thought was, was could this possibly be FTD? That was thrown around at the very beginning. And it took until, until I found a doctor, I had heard her speaking and um, it was Dr. Sandra Black I heard her talking and she was talking about FTD and I just went back to my family doctor and said, this is who we need to go see because it checks all the boxes. And we walked in and she said, can I see his two MRI scans that he had had? I said, sure, here they are. And she said, I can tell you definitively he has FTD. I've often said it's really a choice. And I learned that through a support group at the beginning. Um, I struggled so much and couldn't find a support group for young onset. Finally, I found a, a group with five ladies. Through that, I realized that you have a choice. You have a choice to see the negative every day or to wake up and try to find the positive in the day. And you go day by day. <laughs> So the subject today is around research, and I'm wondering whether you might think back a few years, if you could just, you know, when you and your husband or your husband perhaps initiated the idea of getting involved in some kind of research project, you know, what was on your mind at that time? What prompted you? And then how did you go about finding a research project that, you know, uh, suited you? Um, I think the, the main thing, being given a diagnosis of a terminal illness, you lose all control. You have no control over anything anymore. And you have to choose to accept that or not. Um, we together chose to accept that. And through Dr. Black, she mentioned that there was something called the Andre study. It included things like eye tracking um, at the Kensington Eye Clinic, it included a gait sort of um, section, it included um, genetic testing, an MRI, a SPECT scan, spinal tap. Some of it was pretty invasive. David, right away from the beginning, said, absolutely not. I want nothing to do with that. That's just, you know, not, not good. After we talked about it for a little while, I think I convinced him that there's any kind of control we can have, it's that we can control and help someone else, hopefully. And like Robin said, that you can remove yourself emotionally from all of this. The scientific part of this is so fascinating and amazing. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit more, if you don't mind. What kind of feedback or information would you gain along the way, at either in respect to David or in respect to the overall population of subjects in that study? So there's so many connections in neurodegenerative disease. 
And the more I read, the more I realized how interconnected they all are. And for me, knowledge became power. I started to read more and more and get more and more interested in it. And in that sense, it was, it was almost calming to me to, to understand it. We always felt very supported. I still feel so supported at Sunnybrook. Can't say enough great things. Being in the right place makes all the difference. Now, when you are, um, you know, going in for your annual, these were annual tests. You know, after your experience, were you contacted to see how, how that day went for you, or if there were any questions that came to you uh, after the that day? How would the results have been reported to you? That kind of post test experience, if you will. Right. Unfortunately, the results are not given to you. It's a blind study. Okay. Well, when you mentioned the um, the genetic counseling then was mostly an informational experience, not specific to the results of your husband's test. Um, they did they they did tell us the results of that oh, test. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. And um, they were very open to if you had any questions or any concerns, please call right away, they would answer anything. So uh, otherwise, um, like on the results of the lumbar puncture or the blood tests and that kind of thing, that uh, that data is entered into the pool of data for the study rather than being any uh, reported back to you in any individual way to mark your husband's um, progress or change in situation. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, if there was some kind of a unusual finding, then that would have been brought to your attention or a... to the neurologist. Yeah. Um, in terms of the genetic testing, I'm interested in knowing about that in terms of uh, impact on David's family, if he, you know, his um, siblings, if he has any, or also on your children. Has that been a point of discussion as? That information has unfolded, yeah. Yes, and luckily we went to a great genetics counseling. They do have counseling for you, Um, even just to do the Andre tests. We were set up with a genetic counselor and she explained everything ahead of time, explained what samples they were looking for, what genotypes they were looking for, specifically with FTD, but they were also, you know, screening for Alzheimer's and other ones. It was a big discussion with our children, and I have it with them every once in a while. Even with the eye tracking or the gait, you know, they could have picked out from that, that, yeah, Alzheimer's related or Parkinson's related, you know, um, that could have come up. And uh, yeah, you have to be prepared for that in some ways. You know, they, they do tell you that, that these things could, could arise. The more I learn about it, the more I want to help, the more I want to do. So I joined the PCAC. I've started a Facebook group for those frontotemporal dementia in Durham region. Any kind of other research projects, we were part of the the second part of the Andre study was something called the Remind study. And that was wearables that were actually worn in home. And you were sent home with these monitors on for seven days. The results from that, um, because I'm on the PCAC, we got to see a little presentation on it. And it's fascinating what they can see and what information they're gaining from those tests. That to me is just so exciting and I think, yeah, there's gonna be huge changes coming. Could you describe a little bit more of what your role is in the PCAC? What benefit do you derive from it? What contribution do you make? Uh, the frequency of meetings? So definitely joining the PCAC, um, which I did probably about a year and a half ago, um, it was an opportunity for me to raise awareness for young onset FTD. It gave me a voice. And through that voice, I have now found myself in the co-chair position. (laughs) Very quickly, they were asking me if I would be willing to do, you know, an interview, would I be willing to do, you know, my story, And I said, sure, I'm happy to tell people now. Um, I've lost that sort of at the beginning when you're diagnosed, especially with young onset dementia, there's so much shame and kind of stigma attached to it. 
because people don't understand it. There's not enough information about it. Through the PCAC, I was able to promote the self-care and talk to other people about that. It's not much time involved. There's usually a meeting once a month. As the co-chair now, I have a second meeting. I attend the executive meeting where I get to learn about what's new and what's happening with the doctor's perspectives and all the researchers. We do need, definitely, they're looking for more people. They need more representations from study participants and caregivers. And the whole part of the PCAC is that it's patient-based. They are listening to the patients, what they need, and trying to help that and pass that along to all the other different areas. So the discussion around the table in the uh, PCAC is broader than just the Andre study. It's really talking about the total, your total experience. Definitely. They're very open to different questions we have as, you know, study participants or as caregivers. They want to know our opinion on things. They really do listen and made me feel like I, I'm useful. You know, a lot of times as a caregiver, you feel pretty useless. Yes. You know, day in, day out. So what your experience being communicated uh, to some of these uh, scientists or physicians uh, has the, you know, the potential to inform some of their future work or their current work, yeah. Definitely, I mean, like, as I explained to them, when you go to these appointments, you know, you have months and months worth of information that you wanna share with them and you have 20 minutes maybe if you're lucky to do that in, there's so much more that you want to say and do at an appointment. And it's great to have the audience of the PCAC to, to listen and to make a difference. I was going to say, I hope my voice is you know, used for the good, you know, to, to help people that don't have a voice. A lot of people with dementia do not have a voice. Yeah. Quite often, the research projects for dementia do not involve drugs. They're more observational studies. I think that's a great thing um, that eliminates the whole idea of if you're getting the placebo or not, because I think that would cause a lot of stress to a lot of people. And there was um, quite a few, I, I know at one point, there was a lot of brain stimulation tests. That too would be, you know, you'd have to weigh your risks and your outcomes of that. In terms of like things like genetic studies, as I said before, I'm all for knowledge. The more, the more you know, the more I think you understand and the less you're blindsided by things. I think that's very important. And there's so much stress just around being a caregiver to add to your stress by you know, fearing things in the future. I find that kind of a waste of time. <laughs> you know, they say, don't look back. Just keep moving forward. And I think, yeah, to move forward, you, you need more knowledge. And you're going to get that by participating in a study. Definitely. Definitely. You're going to learn more. You know, when you go to these neurology appointments, they're quite long. So you have a lot of downtime. And I think they could use the downtime a little bit more efficiently by presenting you with the option of going into a study at the beginning of your appointment instead of at the end of the appointment found lots of times, you know, the neurologist will come in and say, oh, well, there's this study, this study, this study. Are you interested? And you've already had your appointment. You've been sitting there for a few hours. It's, you know, you want to go home and talk about it, but they kind of want an answer. So I think if they presented it to you earlier in the appointment, you'd have time to think about it. And then you could ask questions when you were actually in front of the neurologist. That would be one. The other thing would be, I wish that they could share all of the information. So whatever they learn, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, I think it's so important that the family doctor would be involved, you know, any of the other clinics that you go to, any of the other clinicians involved. I think it would be fantastic if they could all share the information. Jill, have you raised this uh, issue that we were just talking about, about sharing information at the advisory committee? Definitely. We talk about it all the time and they're very keen on it. They're, they're trying their best to turn around the information as quickly as they can. 
Well, I want to thank you very much for this conversation, for you taking the time with your husband to contribute to that study and, uh, you know, to go beyond that and to be involved so much in the patient uh, advisory committee. And uh, I'm sure your, your contribution will make a difference in subsequent work. So thank you for that. Andre has evolved and Rick describes how a new study is taking shape. So my name is Rick Swartz. I'm a neurologist at Sunnybrook Hospital at the University of Toronto. I'm also an academic, so I'm a clinician scientist, and I do a lot of research in stroke. Uh, it's my clinical specialty. I'm a stroke neurologist, and my special interest is in vascular cognitive impairment, so the impact of uh, stroke and vascular risk factors on thinking and memory and function, some of those longer-term uh, impacts of stroke. And uh, in part through that, I'm involved in Andre, uh, in this iteration of Andre now as one of the co-leads uh, of Andre more broadly. Yeah, so Andre stands for the Ontario Neurodegenerative Research Initiative, ONDRI. And that really is meant to cover uh, the broad range of conditions that affect the brain and spinal cord uh, and that kind of evolve over time. That's what neurodegenerative really refers to. So that includes uh, the condition known as mild cognitive impairment, which sometimes can progress to Alzheimer's, but not always. Obviously, Alzheimer's disease is sort of the prototypical one people think about. And then Parkinson's disease, uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, which is uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is what the ALS stands for, and frontotemporal dementia, um, as well as uh, vascular cognitive impairment, so stroke and the vascular contributions uh, both in people who present with stroke, but sometimes we also see vascular contributions across those other disorders. So uh, Andre really spreads all of those conditions. And as you say, that's one of the key defining features is that we're looking across diseases. Um, certainly there's lots of room to contribute within disease knowledge and, and, uh, and discovery. Um, but part of the innovation here is uh, collecting standardized data, uh, all of the same types of uh, information across disorders. So phase one was uh, what we call like a deep endophenotyping. We're really trying to characterize across these conditions. And so there were 520 participants in the initial Andre study, uh, each also who had uh, at least one study partner that they enrolled in the study with. Um, so we have some uh, data that's specific even to study partners, things like uh, caregiving burden and um, you know stress burnout kind of uh, measures. As, uh, and, and those 520 participants are across those different cohorts. And uh, as much as they were able were followed over time uh, at baseline year one and year two. Um, some of the, we enrolled the stroke cohort particularly quickly. So we were able to get out to three years for most of the stroke cohort. Um, and we collected the same detailed data um, across diseases and over time. So mentally and, and on the website, we described that uh, with the visualization of the Rubik's cube. So you have an MRI square and you have a detailed neuropsychological square and you have a gait and balance activity square and so on, genetics, eye tracking, retinal imaging, uh, all sorts of deep characterization. Um, each of those is a square, each disorder is a, is a row, and then you get the depth over time. Um, so it was, uh, relatively small sample in that 520, um, but those uh, volunteers were extremely dedicated and really provided uh, a great deal of, of information and, and uh, went through all of these different assessment platforms uh, to provide this really rich data set. Yes, yeah, so, so if I follow the, uh, the Rubik's Cube, you mentioned about five or six tests or data, points of data measurement. Yeah, so so we, uh, we call them platforms. Yes, so, okay. Uh, there's a genetic platform looking at, at uh, genetic markers. Um, there's neuropsychology, so memory and thinking tasks and concentration, that kind of stuff. Uh, there was neuroimaging. Um, obviously, within each of these platforms, there's a number of different pieces of data. Um, I, I mentioned uh, gait and balance, uh, eye tracking, uh, retinal imaging, um, and, and clinical data. So we have a clinical platform, which is you know day-to-day func -day function and mood and sleep and those kinds of uh, more clinical demographic information. So uh, across each of these platforms, multiple different data sets across diseases and over time. Yeah. 
Were there any uh, challenges in recruiting people? You mentioned the stroke cohort uh, came forward pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, were there challenges in other disease conditions? Absolutely. I mean, it's as, as we were just describing, uh, it's a fairly intensive protocol. So it really called for about four days of uh, volunteer time, right? So people who are busy with grandchildren or busy with uh, careers still sometimes, uh, you know, even, you know, trying to manage that in the background of their disorder um, or their, their care partner uh, may also have been, you know, very busy to commit to something like that. So it was a big ask. Obviously, people had to be willing to do MRIs um, over and above the clinical MRIs and provide blood samples and things like that. So it was a bit of a challenge in that sense because we were asking a fair bit of volunteers. Because of what we were asking, it, it did narrow the field a little bit. So people had to be not too severe in order to complete all the different assessments. Um, and obviously had to have a study partner who was willing to engage as well. So. Uh, so that kind of the needs of the study sometimes dictate, uh, you know, the kinds of questions you want to ask sometimes narrow the, the field a little bit. There's been a growing uh, consciousness about the importance of uh, gender, race and socioeconomic status mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, the impact, the differentiation of the impact of a disease, depending on some of those factors. Were you able to build into your recruitment any uh, thing along that line around the characteristics of in those conditions, or is that something for another time? So it's something that obviously we're more focused on in in the current iteration. Um, the you know ten years ago that was less of a a focus. I think more more societally. Obviously, there was a sex and gender was a was a a key issue and it was interesting that we did see uh, a, a more skewed distribution we saw more uh, more men enrolled than women than we expected uh, we're not exactly sure of all the reasons maybe it was because of the requirement for a study partner that uh, older women uh, sadly uh, are sometimes less likely to have older men beside them uh, who are healthy enough to volunteer a study partner so that could have biased things um, we're not, we haven't entirely figured out the, the sources of bias there. In this study, we're looking at involving patients more as partners. And, and uh, the term I like to use is a research care partnership, where the research actually can be used to help inform care decisions or daily decisions that patients or, uh, you know, support, you know, family members or loved ones can, can help use to help them. Um, in their day-to-day -day decision making, or potentially even that their physicians can use, and so we're building into this uh, this study a few key elements. One is a permission to be recontacted. So we're going to ask people explicitly to say, "Can we actually reach out to you and tell you about new things that are going on, and tell you about some of our findings, and say thank you?" Uh, we are giving feedback to participants on the wearable data that we collect, and we're asking them for feedback on our feedback to say. You know, how are you using this? Is this, you know, does this help you in your day-to-day -day activity? What would be better? What there's on the on the order of somewhere between eighty and hundred uh, researchers, clinicians, students, uh, trainees at, at different levels, and then they do come and go to some degree, especially the trainees. Is there any um, active effort on the part of the leaders to monitor the kind of the researcher? participant relationship, or is there an opportunity where the participant might be able to provide feedback to you on how they feel about their experience mm -hmm. in, the, in the research project? Uh, in, the, in the new form, uh, in, the, in the new project, there's, there's specifically that opportunity for feedback. And, and uh, in some of the pilot projects that we've done over the last couple of years, there's been that debriefing process at the end. It's going to be as we as we scale up in numbers, the debriefing is going to be a little bit uh, more formal, less uh, face to face. So we call it the PCAC, uh, the Patient and Community Advisory Committee. We certainly, uh, as the researchers and clinicians, we look to our PCAC members and especially those with lived experience to give you know sort of a unique lens on the research. So we have our our scientists come and 
not go hardcore into the science, but really talk about the so what of it all and the, the high level, what are we finding? And actually we're partnering very early on now. So we've, we've engaged them from the beginning in the Hands Ontario platform and project and the hypotheses and the approaches, the need for feedback and how we want not too much feedback, but you know, uh, you know, trying to titrate that to to the needs of the communities that we're looking to to work with. Um, they've been instrumental there, and so you know, one of our one of our platforms is actually health services uh, research and using the administrative data at the Institute of Clinical and Evaluative Sciences. They come on a fairly regular basis and update the PCAC about sort of not only what they found, but what they're proposing to do and get you know, feedback and impressions, the individuals tell us, oh, you know, I've struggled with this. And sometimes that informs the questions. And the agencies tell us this would really help us to advocate for change at the government level or something. So we can use that partnership uh, to make the research that we're doing uh, that much more relevant, both to individuals and its sort of societal impact. Yeah, That's been a key priority for us. I mean, I, I think fundamentally, we, we don't want um, this whole process of engaging uh, patients and family members and participants in research. We want this to be a, a real partnership. So we're not looking for participants to be disease experts um, or scientific platform or methodological experts, but every single patient who's living with one of these disorders is an expert in what it takes to live with these disorders. I want to uh, thank you very much of particular significance to me is Jill's emphasis on the concept of choice in confronting her husband's situation, very similar to our previous episode with Myrna Norman. I'm encouraged by Rick's positive attitude in including participants in the research enterprise and the direction that Andre is taking in this regard. More information on the Andre project can be found on our website. As well, on our website is a link to the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, where you will find the results of a Canadian project to establish research priorities in the dementia field. It was undertaken with the input of people with lived experience. Thanks to the Ontario Brain Institute for sponsoring this episode and to the Center for Research on Aging and Health at Lakehead University and the Public Health Agency of Canada for their continuing support. My name is David Harvey.